This is a sea urchin. I got a scuba diving off the Big Island in Hawaii. And this one is from Morocco. It's five million years old. Five million years ago, we still looked like bonobos. These look pretty much the same. And here's a fresh one. It has no brain, but it has brain-like cells in each spine. It can move toward food and away from predators. Really slow predators. <laughs> if you turn it over, you'll see a little mouth, five little teeth, and if you crack it open, you'll see little nodules like this. This is the gonads of the creature. This is what we eat. Thank you. <laughs> This same beautiful design has worked all over the world for millions of years, until now. Maine's urchin fishery, despite our best efforts, is collapsing. We tried lowering the limits, we tried setting size limits, we tried shortening the fishing season, but nothing was working. How on earth do you solve such a big problem? Typically, you put someone in charge of it, you get a team, you start to determine all the factors of the issues, and then you divide and conquer, top down. But this didn't work for urchins. Back when I was a teenager, one day I went to my friend's house in the summer and I found him lying on the ground next to his own front porch. He was looking at this black disc on the ground, about three inches wide. And when I got close enough, I could see it was composed entirely of ants, frenetically. And persistently, they were crawling all over each other. Then I noticed there were two ant trails that ended at the circle. One carried big ants coming and going, the other small ants. When the ants would arrive, they were carrying nothing, but departing ants were carrying upon their backs the broken pieces of their fallen comrades. This was an all-out ant war. There were no generals, no officers, no one in charge, no hierarchy, no top-down. But still, we have a war. We have a very organized war. Each ant has in its mind just instinct, simple rules. And out of the collective behavior of those rules, this pattern emerged. And broadly speaking, this phenomenon is called emergence, and it is a hallmark of a complex system. Now, anytime you have a bunch of things doing things to other nearby things, you might have a complex system. It's just a paradigm, a new way to look at old familiar things. Imagine a set of active things or agents. Each one interacts locally. But when you get enough of them together, patterns emerge. Nature is full of complex systems. Have you ever watched starlings in the sky, dense flocks dancing around the sky? I saw some on Wednesday. No one's in charge. In fact, we can model bird flocking behavior now in a computer simulation with just three simple rules. Point the same direction as your neighbors. Don't stray too far from the group. And don't get too close to anybody. They use visual communication. It's all local. Birds are not remotely aware of the bigger picture. We've had success modeling ants as well. Say an ant finds food. Then as she goes back home, she leaves a pheromone trail for her friends to find, and they make it stronger. Ants use pheromones to communicate and coordinate their efforts on caring for the young, caring off the dead, even war. Do we have rules in our heads? When we walk down the street or through a store, we take predictable trajectories. And we're always looking to friends and family to see if we are in alignment with them on major social issues. We act like agents in our economies, in our online communities, in our cities. When you get the idea, you start to see principles of complexity absolutely everywhere. And it brings up deep philosophical questions like, I think locally, I act locally. Am I even capable of seeing our bigger picture? What humanity is becoming? A few years ago, I walked into James Wilson's office because I was looking for something interesting to do. I was a grad student studying computer science at the, Gulf, at the University of Maine, and I was bored of grading homeworks. Wilson is an economist who works for the School of Marine Sciences, and he studies fishery collapse, why it happens and why sometimes it doesn't happen. 
he taught me about natural systems, human systems, and the complexity that's generated when these two collide. And my first task was to study the urchin fishery, its history, and its ecology. Back in the early 1980s, there were way too many urchins in the Gulf of Maine. We had been killing off their predators like the wolf eel. And fishermen were so annoyed with these things, they called them vermin of the sea and whore's eggs. But Japanese buyers showed up offering good money for these whore's eggs. So everybody and their brother jumped into the urchin fishing business. There were people with zero experience being recruited off of docks to don full scuba gear in the middle of the main winter. This is neither easy nor safe. At the birth of the urchin fishery, divers were dying monthly. This was Maine's deadliest catch. But we got better. <laughs> by, by the early 90s, we understood that the best place to find urchins is at the edge of a kelp bed, and the best time really is in the middle of winter. But the good times didn't last. By the mid-90s, the urchin fishery had already hit its peak and was on its way down. We lowered si fishing limits. We set more stringent size limits, but it wasn't helping. We shortened the fishing season. In the bottom half of the southern half of the Gulf of Maine right now, the urchin fishing season is 10 days a year. 10 days. You can't be an urchin fisher anymore. Maybe it's your side job or your hobby, but it's not something you can be. And I'm struck by the questions people keep asking. What should we set for size limits? Fishing season. These questions, they all point back to old fishery management tools. But I know how I feel when someone asks me a question. When someone poses a question, I feel obligated to come up with an answer. Gandhi was once asked, would you be willing to lay down your life? He responded, which is a bad question. <laughs> the urchin fishery, I think, is trapped in old questions. And we need a paradigm, new paradigm, to shift our focus to new questions. Wilson believes the urchin fishery is best understood as a complex system. So he had me build a computer model of it. You're looking at the world of the early 1980s before the urchin fishery began. This is an area of the Gulf of Maine, about two kilometers square. White is land, darker gray means deeper water. Urchins in red, seaweed in green. Each day flies by in less than a second. And each little pixel or square is about 20 meters by 20 meters. And a single pixel might contain hundreds of urchins. The area where it looks like there's really nothing going on, there are sparser populations of urchins you can't see that are actively consuming that seaweed and keeping it down. The important feature here is that urchins are dominating the whole site. Now we're going to fast forward to when the urchin fishery has begun. And keep your eyes on the population in the middle. They're about to start disappearing. And these harvesters come through. I let them come through every couple of weeks for one year, during which they extract 127,000 urchins from this site. What I really know to know is if we stop them at that year, and then fast forward two years after that, will the site recover? Seaweed, dominating. If you look to the right, there's one tiny enclave of urchins still hanging on for dear life. Sadly, this is the world of 2013. The goose is dead. No more golden eggs. See, the urchin barrens, they're not just a side effect of eating seaweed. They're essential for urchin survival. The urchins that are smaller, their predators are still around, but they prefer the sea because they have predators of their own. They're less likely to go for an urchin that's out in the open. But you and I, we humans, we don't roll like normal predators, no. And we don't pick and choose like the wolf eel either. We swoop in and we sweep up everything we're allowed to take. The few that are left, they're all small. They can't eat the seaweed fast enough. The seaweed grows back in, beckoning their predators and their goners. We can't cut the seaweed for them. It grows too fast. And we can't tell divers to not take too many from any given site because too many is too hard to define. It depends on local environments and the, in topology. And the divers already have a hard job to do. They're in water as deep as 60 feet in the middle of winter. It's hard enough just to claw everything you see into a bag. But let's get into the mind of that diver for a second. The boat captain will choose a location much like the site you just saw. 
Then the fisherman sets the diver out at a random spot. And he just generally swims around until he runs out of urchins or he runs out of air. <sighs> Once I got myself in the headspace of complex systems and started to contemplate urchins and divers and seaweed and predators and starlings and ants and patterns. I started to think of new questions. What if the divers swam in a pattern? Well, it's, it's a silly idea. No one would do it. And, well, but I have this fancy, handy simulator thing. Why don't I throw it against the wall and see if it sticks? But with those subtle populations of urchins, you won't be able to see it. So let's put a bazillion urchins in there. So here's a gazillion urchins, and you're going to see the circular fishing patterns. These divers are going to leave some space untouched in between each ring. And the two important features here, the urchins, see that? In between this event and the next, the urchins have enough time to redistribute themselves. And the mere geometry of these shapes will make it so that even after multiple fishing events, there are pockets all over the site left totally untouched. Now let's rewind and do that earlier harvesting simulation with the exact same seaweed and the exact same urchins, but this time it's going to be a circular fishing pattern. It'll be a little subtle, a little too hard to see, but you'll see urchins start to disappear in the middle. These urchin fishers, over one year, extract 124,000 urchins from the site. Basically the same number. Let's fast forward two years after they stop. That's what I'm talking about. There are some sustainable populations of urchins there. They're a little bit hard to see, but if you see the solid lines, those are solid populations. There is a lot of seaweed, but this may even be more what it was like before we started hunting their predators. Two years more in the future, just for fun. They're dominating. They're back. This is actually too many urchins, but this is good news because this means this is sustainable. This goose keeps laying those eggs. How can we get people to buy in, especially if they're going to have to leave some area untouched in between each ring in the circle? I'm buoyed by an idea from the urchin, not the urchin, the lobster fishery. See, we don't take in egg-bearing lobsters, but they wanted to compensate people for them, so they bring them in, they get a V-shaped notch cut in the tail so they don't resell the same lobster, and then it's sent back in the water. Somewhere along the line, lobstermen started doing this themselves. They'll notch the tail, throw it back in without even being compensated. I like to think it's because they feel ownership of the resource and they believe that a little simple idea could make a difference, and it has. That idea has made a difference. My crop circles idea, it's got a few neat features. You leave untouched areas right next to the harvest areas so the urchins can move into them quickly. For less than a 5% drop in your urchin haul, you don't have to kill off the whole population. And it's a simple solution to a complex problem. The complex systems paradigm, it gave me ideas. It took me in new directions, things I would never have thought of. All this work is based on it. Now think about the burning issue in your mind. Whatever big problem that you think about a lot, does it involve a lot of people? Does it have a lot of moving parts? Do you keep hearing the same old questions but no good answers? Well, maybe you don't need a new multi-million dollar pilot program to solve your problem, or maybe you don't need a new governmental agency. Maybe there's a solution that exists that requires just a little bit of effort, but from everybody involved. Complexity led me to simplicity on the other side. I'm really curious to see where it leads you. Thank you.